Hi everyone, hope you're well. Just to let you know that this video is deeply linked to the previous one, which you can find on the card showing up on screen right about now. While this video discusses how function localization discussions evolved across the 19th century, as well as how inhibition became a topic of research and one of the fundamental concepts in neuroscience around the same time, the previous one, while still discussing the 19th century, focuses on electricity and evolution, and how these two discoveries influenced neuroscience. But now that you know that, without further ado, let's begin. At the same time as Galvani and Volta were having their arguments about nerve function and electricity, another major discussion about the brain was raging on. Phrenology had taken over Europe as an explanation for personality, which argued functionality to be specific to certain brain areas. The brainchild of Franz Gall and later Johann Sporzheim, this idea argued that the skull was indicative of the brain's shape and, consequently, that the individual's personality could be deduced from feeling slight bumps in a person's cranium. Although this theory would rage on in the first half of the 19th century, with wide support from the elites of France and England, it was not accepted by scientific circles and received much criticism due to its lack of experimental evidence, leading to its eventual falling from grace in the second half of the century. Despite its demise, Phrenological arguments of brain function were indicative of the thinking of the time, with widespread arguments taking place in scholarly circles between those who argued the brain functions as a whole and those who, like phrenology, saw these different functionalities taking place in different brain areas. And it wasn't long till evidence of this localization of function was found. This evidence came from studies of patients who had, for one reason or the other, found themselves with impaired language capabilities due to lesions in their frontal lobes. These were firstly identified in research conducted by Jean-Baptiste Bollard, Paul Broca, and Carl Wernicke. Although Bollard's research lacked the type of localization we are now used to see, it identified the general area of speech capacity to be in the frontal lobe, and, most importantly, it served as a jumping point for Broca's studies and claims. Broca, a French physician initially identified, in the case study of eight of his patients, lesions to a specific brain area. He identified this area as the main speech production part of the brain, and later supported his claims with further proof, aided by the work of Gustave and Marc Dax, as Marc had identified this area much earlier than Broca, although it was later confirmed that Broca was not aware of this. Now, although Broca had argued this area of the brain, was the origin of all language processing and production. This was soon disproven by Wernicke, who demonstrated how another part of the brain was highly involved in language processing, demonstrating how complex the brain is and how multiple areas can be involved in a specific function, something taken for granted nowadays. The age of brain function localization had begun, and it continues until now, with the argument between localization and widespread functionality continuing to this day. This discussion is fundamental to neuroscience, so I might make a video on this one day, so stay tuned for that. Now on to the next stage of the video, where we're going to be talking about inhibition. One apparent solution to the problem of consciousness that arose during this century, once again, go check my previous video, was the recently discovered brain capacity for inhibition. Inhibition was, initially, introduced as the opposite of excitation of movement and was thought to be a fundamental building block of consciousness and behavior. Using this newfound process, many theories and models quickly appeared, although they all seemed to lack evidence to be very simplistic. However, inhibition did represent a massive step forward in brain function understanding as it presented researchers with the idea, still prevalent today, that one of the brain's main functions is that of control of the body, with Francis Anstey using the example of anesthetics in drugs to make the leap in logic to control, as he argued these substances prevented the brain from controlling the body through inhibition. Another fundamental insight gained during the final decades of the 19th century was related to perception. 
Hermann von Helmholtz suggested that when perceiving a sensation, the brain was not simply registering the stimulus, but that it was making assumptions about the nature of the stimulus, such as when we see flashes of light by pressing on our eyes. To back up such a claim, von Helmholtz utilized other examples, such as the existence of the blind spot in each eye, something which we are not naturally aware of, the production of 3D vision, which is created by our brain processes, the phantom limb syndrome, amongst many others. This represented a shift in mindset from a passive, simply observant and reactive brain to a more active organ. Perception was now also seen as an imperfect and selective process. This is still a fundamental neuroscience principle and has helped neuroscientists advance in their understanding of the brain. So this concept's importance cannot be overstated in neuroscience. Now that we are on video 3 of this mini-series, Something I'm sure you noticed is how fast ideas are developed and how much thinkers and scholars change their minds on topics, something which was not common up until now. If you saw my first video, you'll recall how much it would take for any breakthrough to happen, as work done 200 years ago was still considered modern at the time, whereas it seems that by the 19th century, ideas were being created every year. This is, of course, a trend that only grew from this point onwards, being even more evident today. When scientific papers published 10 years ago sometimes seem obsolete in some areas of research. We can also see how the usage of technology in analogies used to explain brain functioning was still prevalent, specifically in my previous video. Now I can guarantee you that this will continue to be the case up until today, as you probably know. However, Technology wasn't the only source of inspiration for the way that scientists thought about the brain. As we saw with evolution, breakthroughs in scientific thinking also deeply influenced how the brain was seen during this century, as well as the general mindset of scientists. Through these two trends, we can once again observe how locked inside their own time researchers were, something which does not seem to change much, no matter how much progress science has made. That is the end of this video. Stay tuned for the last video of this mini-series, which will be all about neurons, their discovery, and the scientific thoughts surrounding them in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe. As always, you can find references in the description, and until next time, take care.